after a beginner's guide to CNC bits, then stick around because that's what we're covering in this episode. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel and love CNC, make sure you hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest videos. In today's episode, we're going to be going through a basic guide to CNC bits. When you first get into CNC, one of the most overwhelming areas is the selection of bits. You don't know what does what, the material to use them on, the feeds and speeds, it all gets a bit complex. So we're going to try and simplify that today. We're going to look at some of the most common bits used on these desktop CNC machines, understand different things about the profiles of the bits themselves and the way they cut the material. We're going to touch on what bits work best with different materials as well and later on we'll also touch on feeds and speeds. Now I should say on the feeds and speeds section, whilst I'm going to give you some advice and possible tools to help steer you in the right direction, there is no magic answer to that. You need to figure out a bit more about that by understanding more about the bits themselves. So yeah, I'm just stating that up front. Now before we dive in, I'm just going to talk about Graham Bland. If you've seen my previous tutorials um, on calibration and things like that, you know basically what I do is a video interpretation of his written guide. Now whilst I'm not necessarily following his guide directly today, we are covering a lot of areas and I thought it would only be right to supply a link to his guide, introduction guide to CNC bits for beginners. Now as always, he covers things in much more detail than we get time to cover in these videos. So definitely do um, download it, take a look at it and have a read through it and you'll get lots of extra information as I say that we can't necessarily cover in the video today. There's also some links in there to different tool databases for certain pieces of software like Fusion 360 to make your lives easier. Right, so with all that out of the way, the first thing we need to go through is terminology. Let's take a closer look at a bit and understand more about what we are referencing with certain terms in relation to those bits. So we're going to start by talking about the shaft or the shank and this is the solid part of the bit that sits inside of your insert again which sits inside of your collet. Now these are defined by their diameter, the width of the bar that they're machined out of. The most two common sizes for the machines that we use are a 1 8 bit and a 1 quarter inch bit. Obviously this is a 1 quarter inch bit and you get the smaller ones which are the 1 8 bits typically supplied with the machines. The next part is the flute and this is where most of the work is actually done. Now the flute can be singular, it can be plural. You may have 1, 2, 3, 4 depending on the size bit that you have. This scenario here, we have two flutes in a spiral formation. So as they come up, they twist around. You can have a singular flute again in a spiral formation or you can have something like a singular flute as a straight cutter. Now we just mentioned straight bits and obviously this is a spiral one I'm going to come back to this shortly in a second. There's also a third common bit that people often use in these machines and these are the corn cob bits. Now the difference between this as you can see with the spiral there's almost a bit channeled out around it. The corn cob bits have lots of little cutters all around the edge and the difference being because it doesn't have those channels cut into it it actually makes these slightly stronger which is really useful for the smaller bits. If you imagine trying to put a spiral in something this small it would make that bit extremely weak. So you find that these corn cob bits are often in these smaller diameter bits which allow you to do more detail. Now I just said I'd come back to the spiral setup of this and I'm going to bring in another one and put it right next to it. Now can you notice the difference there? In essence they are opposite spirals. What we have going on here is an up cut and a down cut. The one that is fixed in position is the up cut and this one that I'm rotating now is the down cut and I'll explain this in a bit more detail. So to try and explain the difference between an up and down cut a little bit easier I've got a no expense spared prop here. It's just a bunch of uh, pipe cleaners or pastel stemmed all zip tied together. If you imagine the blade on the up cut, as it comes round it's going to be cutting through the material and pushing all of those fibres upwards. So as it's going through it's going to leave these rough edges on top of where it's effectively forcing everything upwards. Now this will be magnified even more on something like plywood or softwood where those fibres are a little bit looser. The looser the fibres the rougher the finish typically you're going to get. Now on the opposite side of that we have the down cut. As the spiral comes around it will be forcing that material downwards so what the end result naturally is 
is a smoother finish on top. It's trying to push the, the cut or the fibers downwards, but there will be material there or a spoil board, something along those lines. Now straight away, you're probably thinking, well, why not just always use a down cut then if you're going to get that better finish on top? Well, there is a trade off between the two. The upcut is very fast and efficient. It can cut and eject those chips at a much better rate because basically scooping them up and out the way really quickly. Now with a down cut, because it's pushing that material downwards effectively and there's nowhere for it to go, it puts more pressure on it. So you have to take it at a slow. So that's the compromise between the two. Upcut is faster and more efficient. Down cut is slower but a nicer finish. Now there is something in between those called a compression bit. Bear in mind what we've just gone, gone through with those fibers and I'll show you the compression bit and explain a little bit about that. What's good about it but also what's bad about it. So if I bring in the compression bit and rotate it around what you can clearly see is two interwoven spirals. We have an up cut and a down cut operating together. Now the benefit to this bit is meant to be that you get the cleaner edges of the down cut whilst getting the chip extraction from the up cut. The up cut is the first bit part of the bit and then the rest is the down cut. Now the problem is with this essentially the up cut is pushing the material this way and the down cut is pushing the material this way. So all that material meets in the middle and still needs to actually be extracted away from the bit. So whilst it seems like a good solution to an up cut and a down cut, they do have downsides to them. The other thing I should also point out is the up cut runs for about the first eight millimeters on this bit before the down cut kicks in. So technically you've got to go very deep with these bits in order to make the most use of them. If you're doing shallow cuts with a compression bit, you're not going to see the benefits of them. I should also say that if you don't see anything mentioned about your bits being an up cut or a down cut, it's likely to be an up cut. Those are the most common ones. Now most of the tips on these bits that I've been showing you aren't square, but you can get ones that are radius. So if I bring this in, you can see that this is completely radius on the top. This is known as a ball nose, B-A-L-L. -L. There is something similar called a bull nose, B-U-L-L. -L. Now the difference between the two of them is the same. This is completely radius over the top, the ball nose. The bull nose has smaller radiuses on the side. So if you imagine it would come up, a slight radius to a flat section and a slight radius back down to the straight side. So that is the difference between them. We'll talk a bit more about this shortly as we get onto the cover in the the most common bits. So let's move on to angled and tapered bits. Now obviously this is typically where the bit comes into some sort of a point and it has an angle down the side. Now you may have an angle on both sides, you may have an angle just on one side. The tip can also come into a point, it can maybe come into a ball as well. So for example this is quite a small point but if I bring this one in next to it, you can see the radius on that tip is slightly bigger. So it doesn't always mean that it goes into like a perfectly formed point. The tips can be different between them. Also, when we're talking about the angles of it, you need to be careful in how yours are being measured. Refer to the manufacturer's instructions and also refer to the software you're using as to how to input the angle of the bit you're working with. So for example, this one that I'm referencing here is often put in as a five degree angle because from side to side, it gives a five degree angle. But if I bring in something like this bit, you can see that one side is offset to the other. So we couldn't get an equal angle from this side. Now the bit when you're importing them, it will give you clear instructions as to what, what angle it is asking for. As I say, follow the instructions from your manufacturer and the software to input these correctly because it can get a little bit confusing. I should also point out that sometimes things are called V-bits, sometimes they're called engraving bits. Now, I haven't found a solid definition between the two of them, apart from the fact that one often refers to the full angle as opposed to the other one referring to half of the angle. But in essence, they do the same job. In a similar way to the bits that we were looking at earlier as well, you will have spiral angled bits. You can also have straight angled bits like this one, or as I say, again, multiple flute or singular flute. So it's about knowing the terms and definitions of your bit to input into the software correctly. Now the final terms I'm going to cover is speeds and feeds. So if I take this out, 
This is often where a lot of confusion comes into those two words as to what they actually mean. When we're talking about the speed, we are talking about the rotations of the bit itself, the RPM, basically what the, the speed that the spindle is spinning this bit at. When we're talking about the feed, it's about the rate that is being pushed through the material or down into the material. So speed is the rotation, feed is the movement of the bit itself. And the last one is depth of cut and this is simply how deep you're pushing the bit into the material for every pass that it's about to make. Now you may already be familiar with the collet setup but it's a bit of useful information to share anyway. Obviously this is an ER11 collet which most of these desktop machines come with. You may have something slightly different if you're using a standalone router but the principles are um, all the same. You have the collet itself and on the end of this will be a collet nut. With inside that collet nut will be an insert bit. This is the part that essentially clamps down on your bit to hold it tight. Now usually to get these out you can just apply, apply a bit of upward pressure, move it side to side and it generally pops out. There we are. Now the important thing about this is to note how deep your bits go inside of this. If I bring these two bits into view now we can see that they have different lengths of shank. Obviously the bits are slightly different length anyway, but the important part is they have different lengths on the shank themselves. Now my general rule of thumb is to make sure the bit is inserted by at least one third, if not up to half. A lot of people have a habit of just trying to put it in a little bit to get the maximum length. If you're trying to cut something deep, you shouldn't try and get around this by only inserting a tiny amount of the bit into the collet itself. You will create something called run out and this is essentially where the bit's rotating but because it has so much flex or movement in it you're not going to get a solid good cut. So my general rule of advice as I say is insert this as deep as possible at least by a third if not up to half and it's just going to guarantee you get a better cut. So in the scenario of using a 1 8 end mill bit, I will generally try and insert it as close up until where the uh, cutting flutes start to ensure it's held as deep as possible to give it the best cutting possibilities. So you just slide it in as deep as it will go right up to where those cutting flutes are and then I would tighten it up at that point. So as with most things, once you start to understand the terminology, it makes learning everything else after that point a little bit easier. What we're going to do now is take a closer look at some of the most common bits used on desktop CNC machines. For the purpose of filming, I am using quarter inch bits so they're a little bit bigger in order to get a better viewing with the camera. But most of the bits we're going to use today exist in both quarter inch format and one eighth inch format in case you are using smaller machines like a 3018 for example. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is an end mill. Now this is one of the most generic bits you'll get and it comes in lots of variations. What it generally means though is you're going to get a straight edged cut down the side or on both sides. Now this particular version is called a flat end mill because as we can see the bottom is flat as well. So you get nice squared cuts as it's going through your material. It's also one of the most versatile bits as well because this type of bit can cut through your woods, your plastics, acrylics and also machine metal as well. I'll move on to other materials shortly. Now as I say, you get different variations of this. So this is a two flute flat end mill. You can also get something like a one flute flat end mill. Now as we can see here, you're still getting the same straight edges from it, the same flat bottom on it, but it only has one flute. So it almost looks a lot coarser. I don't know if the camera can pick this up. This particular one is called an O flute, almost because you have an O straight down the middle of it when you're looking down the channel of the flute itself. Now one of the benefits to a singular flute over a multiple flute is it causes less friction as it's cutting. So for example if you're doing something like acrylic or aluminium where you need to keep the temperature as low as possible on the material a singular flute may work better. And as we've already covered in the terminology these also come in up cuts, down cuts and compression bits as well. Two quick additional points I just want to mention about the up cut and down cut end mills. 
If you're using an upcut bit on a thin material such as maybe two millimeter ply board, you will find that by nature it is pulling the material up away from the bed itself. So if you're just clamping it down around the outside, you will find it's gonna be pulling it off the bed and obviously give a bad cut as a result of that. So when using an upcut on thin material, make sure you're using a method such as blue tape and CA glue that can apply adhesion across the whole surface to avoid putting too much pressure whilst it's pulling it up. With the down cut, you want to avoid using this for materials that require minimal heat transfer. So for example, avoid using a down cut bit on something like acrylic because it's putting more pressure into the material, creating more friction and that's the opposite to what we want. Now I mentioned earlier about these corn cob style cutters. These are also considered to be flat end bills. You still get the straight sided cut and the flat bottoms because not, these are not rounded. The only difference being is the fluted section where you have multiple cutters along these um, corn cob areas versus the spiral style upcuts of these. Now the corn cob cutters are still very versatile and will do lots of different types of materials. But if you have a choice to use the, the fluted spiral types over these, I would definitely recommend it because I always feel you get a better cut with these. But the corn cobs really come into their own as we mentioned earlier when you're doing the finer detail because we can get smaller heads on them as we can see in this collection here. So this end mill that we're looking at now is called a ball nose end mill, B A double -L, L. Going back to the terminology, there is a variation of this called a bull nose, which has a flatter bottom. Now the difference between this is you're still going to get the uh, squared sides or straight sides down the edge, but you'll get a fully radius bottom of it. So if you're trying to do curved um, designs or shapes, Something with a ball nose is going to work better, but as I say, you still get the benefit of having the straight edges. So next we're going to take a look at V-bits or engraving bits. Now as mentioned earlier, they're pretty much the same thing. The end result is going to be a V-shaped profile that's cut into the material. Now your first encounter with these on a desktop machine is likely to be these small 1 8 V-bits that they supply with most machines. These are often either 10, 20 or 30 degree angles. Most commonly though it is the 20 degree ones that they supply in the kits. Now these can be okay to start off with but you often find that they go blunt very quickly. Also if you are doing finer work on materials, um, especially things like aluminium, they can be versatile because they have a much smaller more like cutting tip at just 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters wide. But let's move on to look at some of the bigger variations. Now, as in a similar way as with the end mills, you can get different options within the V-bits themselves. So if we start with the first two, these are both 60 degree V-bits, except we can see that one has a single edge cutter, whereas the other one has two flutes. Now, they're both going to give you the same results. Obviously, there is a difference in the size though. Similar scenario over here. These are both 90 degree V-bits. One has two cutters and one two flutes. The other one has four. Both of them are straight flutes. But again, similar scenario in that the one will naturally be able to get a V carve much wider because it is a bigger head. I should also point out that when you start moving to higher quality bits on the V engraving bits, you get interchangeable blades. So as these edges start to go blunt, you can either rotate the blade round, put a new one in, and it just means the bit will ultimately last you longer. As opposed to these ones that when they start to go blunt, you either need to try and sharpen the bit yourself or ultimately buy a new bit because they obviously won't last as long. So the next bits we're going to take a look at are called tapered ball nose end mill bits. Now in a similar way to the V-bits that we were just looking at, you will get a V-shaped profile from the cutting of these. But crucially the difference is the angle of this V-cut will usually be somewhere between 4 and 6 degrees as opposed to the other bits that start at about 10 degrees. So it is a much narrow, more acute angle that you're going to get from these tapered bull nose bits. The other important thing to note is the tips on these are slightly rounded. 
So the V-bits that we looked at earlier will have a tip of about 0.1 millimeters, where the smallest that these typically start at is 0.25 millimeters, so a quarter of a millimeter. And they're also radius, given away by the name of a bull nose. So because they are radius, you will get a smoother finish, especially when doing things like 3D relief carvings. They're also great for doing fine text work as well, because they have such a narrow end on them or a narrow head you can really get that finer detail in the uh, 3d relief carvings and the text so they are very versatile bits you can also use them across multiple materials as well such as wood mdf acrylics and metal if you really want to the last bit I'm going to mention is a surfacing bit, also known as a bottom cleaning bit. Now we can see with this, it is extremely wide on the bottom. For the purposes of what we do on the CNC machine, these usually only get used when you're doing something like surfacing a spoil board. And you have to take them quite shallow because obviously if you go to cut quite deep with these bits, it's going to require a lot of pressure and torque from the motor that these machines typically don't have. Now, whilst you will not use these very often, it is a good tool to have in your collection because, as I say, they're brilliant for doing things like surfacing spoil boards and making sure surfaces are completely flat. Because of the big flat bottomed area on them, it makes it easier to get those level surfaces. So I have no doubt that as I've been showing you the different bits, you will have noticed that some are just a normal metal colour and others have this blue tone to them. Now, the difference is the ones that have the colour have had some sort of coating applied to the flute area of the bit the sharp cutting area now whilst it doesn't necessarily make the overall bit any stronger it is meant to make the sharp cutting edges of the bit more durable and therefore last longer so your sharp edge should remain for longer now the blue one is typically called nano blue and this is a silicon carbide mixture the goldy color over here on this metal burring set is a titanium nitride mixture now i don't know the differences between the two of them and i can't really say if one is better than the other because i've never done side-by-side -side testing with them but typically if it has some sort of coating like this it's expected to last a bit longer remain a bit sharper and also they do just look a bit cooler with the colors now don't get that confused with ones like this where they have a painted tip the painting is just there really for protection it doesn't actually add any value to the bit itself so that's just some of the more common bits there are obviously others available what i would say though don't overlap routering bits with cnc routering bits there is some gray area but keep them separate same with dremel bits as well i often see people saying can i use dremel bits in my cnc yes they will fit no they're not appropriate it, that is really the key, it's about the appropriate bit for the job you're doing or the machine you're on. So for example, those large V-bits that we saw earlier, something like that isn't going to be as appropriate in a 3018 with a smaller spindle because it'll struggle to drive such a large bit. So in that scenario, you would use a smaller V-bit to get your job done. Now let's move on to feeds and speeds because, well, this is probably the part of the video I'm most apprehensive about because to try and explain it, it gets quite complicated and probably going to require a bit of rambling from me. So I think the best thing for me to do is we'll cover why it's so complicated and if you manage to stick through all of that, I'll then try and explain the simplest way to get through that. So the reason it's all complicated, well, it revolves around different equations and calculations. So for example, to get your feed rate, you need to multiply your spindle speed by your chip load and times that by your the amount of flutes on that particular bit you're using. And you probably go, well, that doesn't sound difficult. How do I get my chip load though? Well, to get your chip load, you need to take your feed rate and divide that by your spindle speed times the number of flutes. So straight away in those two equations, we have a bit of a circular motion going on. To get our feed rate, we need to know the chip load, but to get the chip load, we need to know the feed rate. Doesn't make sense, does it? And that's part of the problem, if I'm honest. Those are just two of the equations. If you wanna see the full list of equations you potentially need to calculate to get this, check out Graham, uh, Graham Bland's guide, he breaks them all down. But ultimately, there are multiples of these calculations and they just go round in circles. You put one, you need one value to get the other value to get the third value and it, yeah, it just really starts to get confusing. To try and explain this a bit further, let's take a scenario. I wanna use an end mill on a 3018 machine. 
So I know straight away there are at least three spindles available for a 3018 machine, a 10,000 RPM, a 12,000 RPM and a 20,000 RPM. Three things into the variable mix. We said we're going to use an end mill. So again, we know there's a quarter inch end mill, there's a one eighth inch end mill. There are all those corn cob end mills as well, all in different size variations. Another batch into the variable mix. How many flutes does that end mill have? Does it have one, two, three, four, five? Yeah. Another batch of numbers into that, that variable of equations. Now, that's before we've even got onto materials. Um, do I want a machine hardwood, softwood, plastics, acrylics, resins, aluminium, foam? Another bunch in to the set for the equation. And in order to have a, a guide or a calculator to give us the answer to all of those different options, somebody needs to map it all out. And that is just for one bit on one machine. So you can see why it gets so complicated and why there isn't such thing as a calculator to just put your things in and get the end result that you're after. So with that rambling out the way, how do we move on and make things easier? How do we get the results that we're after? Well, the honest answer is you need to experiment. Not the answer you want, but it is the truthful answer. Your machine will talk to you as your machine and you need to listen and pay attention to it. Now, don't go in by trying to do a job that you need to do for a gift for someone. Do test jobs, play about, experiment. So for example, just do a square in something like easel and put, a, put some rough feed rates in. My advice is always start slow and build up. And what I mean by slow is like 400, 500 millimeters per minute at a depth of maybe 0.3 or 0.4 millimeters per pass. I always focus on the feed rate and the depth rather than the RPM because these machines can't really track RPM. So it's, it's more of a guess variable in there. So for me, I change the feed rate and the depth of cut as opposed to messing about with the RPM. So as I say, start off slow, something like 500 RPM and just do a square where you can play about and it's going to machine it out. Now, when you use your control software, um, if you're using the most common ones like UGS, Candle and G-Code Sender, they have a variable adjuster within them. So you can adjust that feed rate live as your machine is working. So as I say, you do that square and as you're watching it, you can take the speed up and you will see that it increases and you will see the difference in the chips that you're getting off that particular job. Now, if you take the speed up, those chips should in theory get bigger, but you will get to a point where the chips get too big and you start to get what's called chatter, which is where your machine is struggling to cut through the material and it starts to vibrate and sound a bit nasty. Once obviously you get to that point, you know you're going too fast, so you would need to pull it back to find the right spot. Equally, if you're at the opposite end of the scale and you're going too slow, the chips you're going to be getting off are going to be really fine dust-like. And basically what that means is you're not going fast enough to get nice quality chips. So in, that, so in that scenario, you would speed things up. And that's really the best way to find the, the correct feed and speed for that bit and that material that you're using. As I say, just experiment, take a bit of time to play and pay attention to your machine and the sounds and the chips that you are getting off it. Keep a record of those make a note of what you consider to be a successful cut. So, you know, if you cut through some pine at a rate of 800 millimeters per minute at a depth of 0.7 millimeters, make a note of that. And what you'll find is that this starts to become second nature. When you go to do a job or designing in your software, you will just start to know, right, the last time I did that, it was X, Y, and Z. I'll program those speeds in. As I say, it's not the answer you want, but it is the honest answer of how we all learn to find those feeds and speeds. There are much more intelligent people in all these Facebook forums and CNC groups than myself, and they haven't yet found a way to get a calculator to work for all of these um, smaller desktop CNC machines. So I do apologize, but ultimately, yeah, that is the best way to find out the correct feeds and speeds for the jobs that you're on. Take a deep breath. Now with that out of way, I think what I'm going to do is just move on to V carves before the end of the video and before we wrap up. Now the reason I want to talk about V carves in a bit more detail is people often get mixed up on how a V carve works. So I'm just going to explain that in reference to the V bits that we were taking a look at earlier. So let's move on. So what we're looking at is what appears to be two identical stars carved into this piece of MDF. Now if I show you this clip over the top, you should start to see that those stars are not actually identical in the way that they have been carved. In essence, they have been carved in two slightly different styles. 
Now, whilst they are both considered to be V carves, the top one is a traditional V carve and the bottom has had a flat depth applied to it. Now, I'll bring in the V bit to try and illustrate this a bit better. Now, on the traditional V carve, the widest area of this star is the middle. So to achieve machining that out, it will take the bit down as deep as it needs to, to bridge that gap from left to right. If I rotate, you can see that that just covers both sides of the star. However, on the one that's had the flat depth applied to it, when I bring the V bit in and place it in the middle, you can see that I can rotate that round and it doesn't come close to the edges. The reason for this is on the traditional one, it will bring the V-bit in and as I say, take it as deep as it needs to, to maximise and fill that gap. But on this version, it will bring it in, take it to the three millimetre depth that we set, and then it will do smaller, lighter passes, basically to machine that middle area out. Now, why is this important? Well, crucially, when you're using a traditional V-carb um, setup, it will go as deep as it needs to, to fill that gap. So if you're trying to complete quite a wide gap, it will continue to plunge that V-bit as deep as it needs to. So in this case, we have something like 18 millimeter MDF. So we can go quite wide, but if you're machining thinner material like six mil, eight millimeters, something like that, the wider the gap, you're basically gonna have the V-bit sticking out the bottom as it starts to go deep and carve through it. The other thing as well, is it's about bit selection. So if I bring in some of the other V-bits that we saw earlier in the video, you can see that they've all got slightly different depths. So for example, if we take probably what is the smallest one, whilst this is a 90 degree V-bit, it's only the width of the shank itself, which is a quarter inch. So in actual fact, it can't go that deep in order to complete the job. So that is something to bear in mind when you are looking at v carves. Now, not all software can do both of these options. Some of the better software like CarveCo and Vectric can, but some of your more basic options may not be able to, such as Carboid Create by default will do a traditional v carve like this, where it takes it the maximum depth it requires, but something like Easel will set a depth to it. So there are pros and cons to both, but it is about picking the right one that suits the job that you're doing. If I slide this across a little bit, just to try and illustrate what I mean a little bit further. Now in this cube, we can see that we have wide sections and we have shallow sections. So if I bring the V bit round to the widest section, you'll see how deep it is. But then as I drag it up to the shallow section, you can see how the V bit rises. And this is basically how a V carve traditionally works. It doesn't carve it all at one level, unless you've set something like a flat depth to it. So if you've been paying attention, you should now know every single bit you'll need to use, all the different feeds and speeds for them across every material you'll ever want, correct? Wrong. I told you at the start, there's no magic answer for this. And everything we've gone through today is about giving you the knowledge and confidence to go forward, do that experiment in understanding more about the bits and how they work with your machine to be able to go on that journey to find the speeds and feeds for your particular setup. Now, if you really are struggling, reach out on like the Facebook groups. There's always somebody online like myself or Graham, and we can probably get you roughly in the right direction. We, we won't be able to give you the exact feeds and speeds because of everything that we've already gone through today. You should understand why, but we can probably start to get you close. Now, just mentioning Graham, don't forget his guide in the description area below. It's like all the extra detail and the tool databases as well, which can be very useful. I'm also gonna put a link in the description area to a. Um, general overview PDF of lots of different bits and the materials that they're recommended to be used on. It's kind of a quick reference guide to keep on your desktop or something like that. And as I say, again, it can be very useful. Now, if you've enjoyed today's video and you found it useful, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps the video, it really helps the channel. If you're about to give it a thumbs down, at least let me know why in the comments section below, because I do always enjoy feedback on how we can improve things on the channel. Thank you everyone to watching. Final thanks always goes to my patrons. Thank you for supporting the channel. If you want to get involved, check out the patron links in the uh, description area below. But if not, I'll see you all on the next episode.